بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillah, all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us, who nourishes, who has provided for us, who continues to provide for us, who takes care of us, who has mercy on us, who is very, very compassionate towards us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from all this goodness that he has. We send blessings and salutations to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and your families, your offspring, your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all guided and bless us all up to the end of time. Amin. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, I am very happy to be here with you. And at the same time, I ask you all to pray for me. And inshallah, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant us all Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah grant us paradise and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those whom He is pleased with. As you know, we are speaking of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One might ask, why do we need to please Allah? That's a question I was asked by a little child once. Why do, you, why do we need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I think that's a good question. It will take us back to where we were before we were born. So if I were to ask you, if you were, say, 45 years old, where were you 46 years ago, 47, 50 years ago? Where were you? You would have to say one of a few things. If you didn't believe, perhaps you might say, I don't know. Or sometimes if you do believe, but you really don't know, you might want to say, I don't know. If you want to hear the correct answer, you might say, I don't know. But it's very important for you to keep asking yourself the question, why was I created? Where was I before I was born? And where will I go after I die? That will help you understand why you need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Allah? Allah is not a human being. Allah is not a creature. Allah is the creator. Allah is the one who made. Allah is the supreme deity whom we all worship. We call him the maker. When we say Rabbun, it is actually a powerful term. It means the one who made you. The one who nourishes, provides, protects, who cures. The one who is in absolute control of every aspect. Not only of your existence, but entire existence. He's in control of it. So, if he created, he says, أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرُ تَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, it is he. For him, was the creation. For him is the creation. The creation not only belongs to Allah, it was made by Allah. If he made it, he has the right to instruct. That's something you need to know. Why does Allah have the right to instruct me? Because he created, so he has the right to instruct. If you made something, you will choose, you will decide. If you are a head of a school, you will decide the rules of the school or you will fulfill what the system would like you to fulfill in terms of rules that govern that particular school. So if you go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that he made us, it is definitely his right to decide what he wants from us. But now I need to know where I was before I was created. There is only one option. Only one option. I need to read what my maker said. Because science doesn't have the answer. Doesn't. Medicine does not have that answer. Where was I? Say, someone might say, well, you know what? You might have been separated in the form of, you know, a droplet of sperm and perhaps an egg. What about before that? What about before my mom and dad? And what about well before that? I was definitely nothing. Allah says, 
هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن لم يكن شيئا مذكورا Has man not passed through a time where he was nothing to be mentioned? The beginning of Surah Al-Dahar. Before you were born, nothing to be mentioned. No one could talk about you. At, there was a stage when people didn't even know whether you were male or female. Only later on they found out. After a certain period of time or when the embryo was there, then they could test and see. Male or female? What about before that? They didn't know. They had no idea. So that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created, He decides. The only thing I have to be able to tell me where I was is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's revelation. It's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the previous prophets, they brought that news and information. Confirmed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where were you? We were in the form of souls. Allah decided subhanahu wa ta'ala that he wants to be worshipped and he wants to test whom he will call Banu Adam. He calls us Banu Adam in the Quran, the children of Adam alayhi salatu wa salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that and therefore he created us. And he tells us, don't lose the path. Don't lose the path. There is a path. I will show you, subhanAllah. You know the beginning of Surah Al-Dahr? If you read the first verse, I just read it. Do you know what the next one says? Inna <laughs> Indeed, we have created man from a droplet of semen mixed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, obviously, it mixes. It mixes with what? You have the male, the female, gametes fuse creating a little zygote, embryo, fetus, call it what you want at a different stage. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in order to test him, in order to test him, that's why we created him. And in order to pass your test, we gave you faculties. You have a brain. If you didn't have a brain, you, you don't worry. The test is not yours. The pen will never be lifted. If you were born without the faculty of the mind, don't worry. If you were born unable to see, unable to hear, your test is limited to what you've seen and heard. Understood. A person who, for example, is told this is beef. He cannot see. And... He relied on being told that it was halal and he couldn't see, he couldn't take it a step further. He happened to consume it. His test stopped at a point where his ability stops. The same with all of us. If you are unable to do something, your test has stopped. But when you are able to do something, your test continues up to that ability. So Allah says, we gave you the faculty of hearing and sight. It's part of your test. You're going to come onto the earth. And yes, after a while, we will take you away like we've taken away those before you. Now the difficulty is on earth. When we get here, there are many distractions. So much so that the distractions become the main focus of the people. And this is why Allah reminds us, to go and look at where you're going to go after your life here. And I want to spend a moment, if you would like to know what the world will be like after you have departed, take a look at what has happened when those you have known have departed. I want to ask you guys a question. And I know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all those who've passed away Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah have mercy on those. Uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and have mercy on us the day He takes us away to. As mu'mineen, you and I know that when a person passes away, we are taught to make dua for them, to supplicate for them, to ask for them goodness, the mercy of Allah, and so on. How many of you have lost a family member. Please put up your hand high. Almost all or a lot. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. Now, 
I'm not going to ask you if you miss them or not. And I'm not going to ask you how much you think of them. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to inform you how much you think of them. I want to tell you that when they died, you missed them more. You cried for them. You perhaps missed them a lot. And as the days passed, it's not like you did not want to miss them. It could have been a father. It could have been a mother, a grandfather, grandmother, your brother, your sister, your child. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them Jannah. But I promise you, you become busy with your own life. And what happens? There comes a time when if I were to ask you 10 years later, you'll say, I had a child who drowned. May Allah grant him Jannah to Firdaus and make it a means of you entering Jannah too. I had a child who drowned. And that child, I, I, you know, I missed the child so much. But nowadays, I think of the child once in a while. We have a father, for example, who may have passed away. Initially, it was difficult. Initially, we cried. Those of you who've lost a father, maybe 15 years back, you will admit that it's not like you don't want to miss them. But Allah has kept your test separate from your father's test. So therefore, you tend to remember them less. You become busy with work, with earning. You go to work every day, you come back. You become busy with your own spouse and children, and so on. So what happened? Life continued. People forgot those whom they loved. Exactly the same way they're going to forget you. Your children will think about you less and less and less. When you get much older, it's no longer about your father, your mother. You may remember them once in a while and say, Allah, irhamhum. may Allah have mercy on them. But in all honesty, it becomes less as time passes. Isn't that a sign? A sign that at a certain point, your most beloved people will forget about you. You were buried and gone just like you buried others. And they went and it started diminishing. The amount you thought of them and missed them began to diminish. Why did Allah keep it that way? Because before you came onto the earth, there was no connection between you guys. There was no connection between you. Your father didn't know he's going to have you. Allah knew. But that was all a test. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they worship me. It's a test for them. So when we get engrossed in what the world has to offer in a way that it makes us lose focus upon that which we are definitely going to encounter, then we are at loss. I'm not saying don't live your life. I'm not saying don't have nice things, good things. But that is all secondary, to be honest with you. Primarily, you don't know when you're going to go. You don't know how long you're going to live for. You don't know if you're going to be able to use what you are striving towards earning regarding this world. A person is after a million pounds and he thinks to himself or she thinks to herself, look, I'm going to really earn my first million. And I want to make sure that I get it. And subhanAllah, they start working towards it. If they have forgone their dress code, they've forgone their salah, they have forgone their halal and haram, they have forgotten all about their duties unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they get that million, let's be honest, what's going to happen? A day will come when they have to return to Allah. They have to go back to Allah. Come what may. You could have had the latest phone, the latest car, the latest home, the most updated kitchen, subhanallah. The voice controlled kitchen, I'm sure you know about it. You could have had anything, but at the same time, you will leave it behind. When you came onto the earth, when you came onto the earth, you came with nothing. Many of us, our fathers or mothers or parents couldn't afford even to send us to school. And then Allah blessed us and Allah bestowed upon us. But it becomes so sweet that we forget what the real sweetness is. And that is the pleasure of Allah. When Allah is pleased with you, you taste the sweetness in whatever He's given you. Whatever He's bestowed upon you. Whatever comes in your direction. You know, the affairs of a true believer are amazing. If goodness comes in His direction, He's happy. He thanks Allah. And, he, and everything is okay for him. And if something befalls him in terms of calamity or negativity, he bears patience. He knows Allah is happy with me. 
Nothing more I want. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says on more than one occasion, and one of those instances was just at the time when he was in Ta'if, coming out of Ta'if, and the angels came to him saying, we can destroy these people because they are harming you. And he says, oh Allah, if you are pleased with me, there's nothing more I want. If you are happy with me, there's nothing more I want. Why? All this I'm going to leave here. Now I'm talking about ourselves, right? Those who have hassled us and harassed us, we're going to leave them behind. Those who have helped us and kissed us, we're going to leave them behind. Those whom we've had children with, we're going to leave them behind. The very children, we're going to leave them behind. Our money, left behind. iPhones, left behind. You can hand them over, inshallah, when I'm complete there, inshallah. (laughs) Everything left behind, subhanallah. Completely left behind. Have you thought of it? And we fought for it. I'm not saying you're not allowed to pursue that to a degree you are, not beyond that limit. So the true pursuit is for the pleasure of Allah. I will have my iPhone, but I will work towards it. I will make sure I don't do something haram to get it. And I will make sure that it does not make me go against the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you get your iPhone, subhanAllah, or it's just an example, okay? I use Samsung, by the way. So, once you have that phone, what happens? How you use it really will be for you or against you. Everything you do is actually a test for you or against you. Is it within the pleasure of Allah or not? If it is, tick, you passed it. If it is not, cross, you failed it. That's what it is. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors, to be pleased with us, work towards it. If you... Come to Allah even a little bit. He comes to you much more than that. He's the creator. He does not need our worship. We need it. It's our test. Do you know the examiner knows the answers to the test? The mathematics test. The the examiner knows the answers. But the examiner will not tell you the answers. Because then the test does not become yours. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's case, yes, he's the examiner. He's testing us. Indeed, he told us the answers and he's telling us, I'm going to put you through situations. You know the answer. My brothers and sisters, we all know what is right and wrong. We all know what is expected of us as Muslimin. And it's beautiful. Yes, there is a lot of discipline. Goodness, kindness, so much more. Worship Allah alone. Follow the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as best as you can. Stay away from sin and where you have faulted, go back and repent. That's an answer. Imagine that's that's like erasing the answer, the wrong answer and putting a right one. You know, when you enter the examination room, there is a specific period of time and you must answer in that period of time. And what happens is if you've written the wrong answer, you can ask for another paper. You can cross out the wrong answer for as long as it's within the time and you can write the correct answer. Once the bell rings, once the time is up, you have to hand those papers in. It's gone. The same applies in this world. We are in the exam room for as long as we are breathing, for as long as we are alive. You can keep changing the answers. You can ask for a new sheet. Tawbah, subhanallah. You can turn back to Allah. I made a mistake. For example, those who might have committed big crimes, those who were hooked onto pornography, for example, or adultery or gambling or drugs or anything else. They can say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, I have changed my ways. I regret. I'm not going to do that again. You're given a new page. Now you write the correct answer. And what happens? That carrot will dangle itself again. I know of a young man who quit pornography after a few years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the strength to quit whatever bad we might be doing. Whether it's that or something else. So he quit it and then he says after a while that you know immediately after that things happened to me that seemed to be making this bad habit of mine dangle in front of my eyes as though it's teasing me. Now you've asked Allah's forgiveness. Let's see. It's going to be made much easy. You're going to come. You're going to come. That's your test. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who says, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to drink alcohol anymore. And suddenly they enter Tesco's and there's a huge sale. You know, that which he used to drink so much. And suddenly it's, you know, two for the price of one. And he's looking at it and he says, Allah... I promised you I'm not going to do it, so it's over. That's a winner. That's the pleasure of Allah. Whereas another one would say, Allah, I know you're so merciful. So you know what? After the sale, I'm going to quit again. 
If that's the case, there'll be another sale and another sale and another sale. But when you've pleased Allah, there is a sweetness that is of a different nature. There is a sweetness of a different nature. You know, sin has a sweetness that is fake. It has a sweetness. People are excited. It, it's a boost. And you go. It's like cheating in the examination. It's so exciting until you get caught. And then suddenly your headlines on the news. Why? You cheated. After having all A's, what did they do? It's like those who, you know, the Olympics just passed now. I don't know about this particular one. But in previous ones, the example is those who won the race. And six months down the line or after the race, a few weeks down the line, it was found that their blood sample was or had traces of something that was unacceptable. How do they feel? It's a disgrace, not only to themselves, but the whole nation that they were serving. So imagine when a person commits a sin, I told you there is a fake sweetness. There is a sweetness. Shaitan pushes you to it. Adultery is far sweeter than being intimate with your own spouse, but it's a fake sweetness. It comes with a lot of regret afterwards. It comes with a lot of darkness afterwards. It comes with a lot of bad within a person. It leads you to something else and another. It leads you to take Allah out of the equation in a way that when you're on your deathbed, you start thinking, whoa, what did I do my entire life? Did I pursue the pleasure of Allah? No, I didn't. I pursued the pleasure, my own pleasures, the pleasure of the devil. I became a devil myself. I went against the commands of Allah. People say Islam has too many rules and regulations. I say, yes, full of discipline. You, if you're disciplined, you achieve. We've given examples in the past of private schools. They have many more rules sometimes than schools that are perhaps public. Not to say any one of the two might be getting better results. That's got to do with how hard they worked perhaps. But the general idea that we have, especially in my part of the world, is when you're sent to a school that has a lot of rules and regulations, your character is refined, your conduct. People can see it just from the way you speak. The way you interact, many rules, regulations. So we too as Muslimin have a lot of rules and regulations. And Allah says, when I have prohibited you something, this is, these are the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When something is prohibited, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited something, stay away from it. And when, when something is instructed, do it as best as you can. Do it as best as you can. Amazing. That's how you will achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be focused, my brothers and sisters, upon something that will destroy all prohibited desires. Anything that is lustful, prohibited, that which is immoral, that which is filled with sin, the regret, or should I say this, that which is transgression against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you really are focused upon the fact that in a few moments, you're going to be meeting with Allah. Then by His will, by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be able to do more to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be able to do much more. Like I said, the worldly life is marketed today in such a way that it makes it seem like that is the focus. That is the main aim. Those people are at a loss the day they die, everything comes to an end. Whatever they lived for is over. Now they are in a place where they did not prepare for. That's the difference between a believer and the one who doesn't believe. A believer believes that I'm going to go somewhere. I need to prepare for that eternal place more than I've prepared for the few years I'm here. You know, a lot of us, we want to buy a home, a house, mashallah. So... What happens? We end up paying towards the house for many years. Say 20 years. That sounds realistic, right? 20 to 30 years. We end up paying slowly in installments. Inshallah, halal installments by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we end up paying slowly. How many years did you pay for the house? You paid for it 25 years. Let's say 25 years, okay? Because I didn't hear a, hear a yes when I said, is it realistic? So maybe in Britain, it's five more years. Okay. So... 25 years you paid 
You started at the age of 25, you paid for another 25 years. By the time the house became yours, you were 50 years old. You had another 13 years if you lived as long as Rasulullah who was the most loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say you died at 63, that's where he passed away. So 63, you had another 13 years to enjoy what? The house. 13 years later you went or I went. May Allah grant us Jannah al firdaus But if we didn't prepare for the palace of the hereafter, which is eternal, then... We would have just had a house for 13 years here in the world. That too, you have roof leaks, you need to update the house, you need to paint it, you need to change the wallpaper every now and again. And if you have a bossy spouse, you need to change it every so often. <laughs> Notice I didn't say wife. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, the idea here is, yes, you want your home, you will have your home, everything is fine, it's beautiful, but just prepare for the other one. It's not so difficult, it's intertwined. Don't miss your salah while you're earning for the house, this, this house. So I'm paying for that house and this house. You hear that? Worship Allah alone, that's by far the biggest payment. So wherever others are being worshipped besides Allah, deities, or wherever polytheism is being committed, just by staying away, it's a payment for the akhirah. Allahu Akbar. It's a payment for the hereafter. Wherever Muhammad sallallahu path is, you follow that path. It's a payment for the hereafter. By seeking Allah's forgiveness, it's a payment for the hereafter. You're paying for that house. That is the pleasure of Allah. Because a true winner is he who or she who is going to be on the day of judgment, proud of what he or she has done. You know, the ideal, the ideal as a Muslim is as follows. It's called, or should I say it's encapsulated in a dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Allahu Akbar. Oh Allah, grant us goodness in this world. We all want it. Oh Allah, I want a beautiful spouse. I want lovely children. I want those who will be the coolness of my eyes. I need a bit of cash as well, Ya Allah. And I need so many other things. I need, uh, you know, I need a beautiful house, a nice car. I need ease. I need good health. MashaAllah, that's dunya hasana. That's the, the hasana of the dunya. It's a powerful dua, right? I know tonight we're all going to be saying that, mashallah, 10 times, 11 times, 12 times, no restriction number of times, but we're going to be repeating it. Oh Allah, dunya hasana. And we're going to think of all the things I said, right? Maybe even more. Subhanallah. You want a good complexion, a nice skin without makeup, mashallah. Yeah, 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 I know. But at the same time, subhanallah, you got to say, wa fil akhirati hasanatan. That's not it. That's not it. Even if you would... Astaghfirullah. Okay, let's say it. Even if when you died, they had to put makeup on your face to look good. Trust me, when you went into your grave, that face will still decompose. Sounds gross, doesn't it? I had to say it for you to understand the power of wafil akhirati hasanata. Oh Allah, when my bones are decomposed, when my face is no longer recognized by human beings, you recognize me as a friend of yours. Allahu Akbar. Well, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala befriend you when you have made it your business to befriend him? By doing what? I'm going to get up for Salatul Fajr, no matter how difficult it is. I'm going to try. My sisters, I want to tell you something one of my relatives told me. You know, nowadays the industry of makeup has become serious. It's become face painting rather than, you know, makeup. It's become something totally different. It used to be makeup, people used to say halal, haram, we used to say okay, within certain limits. Nowadays it's become so, so much. And one of my relatives says, we get lazy to fulfill salah because you're holding in your wudu knowing that you know what? I don't want to break my wudu because I don't want to remove my makeup. If that's the case, go without makeup. You might be saying, what did he say? I'm honest with you, if you have a choice, and if that's going to shift you out of salah, make it qada, you know. We have qada, we have salah that is shortened and perhaps, you know, read in a different way in journey. There's no verse of the Quran that says, when you've put makeup, the same rule applies. There isn't. So if you want to make Allah happy, if you are in pursuit of the pleasure of Allah, you will know your limits. And if you have to make wudu, so what? I will wipe it off. I will take it out. I will make my wudu correctly. And then I will earn the pleasure of Allah. I will fulfill my salah. 
But that comes first. Something's just come to my mind. I'm going to share it with you because I don't know when next we'll get an opportunity to speak. You see, sometimes there are certain things that are questionable. If you know halal is clear, haram is clear, in the middle there is something that may not be so clear. The hadith teaches you to stay away from it to save yourself. That's the hadith. In Sahih Muslim, it's a hadith of Numan ibn Bashir. It's a powerful hadith. Everyone should know it. So one of the examples is, I was asked once, and I didn't do deep research, okay? I was asked once about a certain type of nail polish. And people told me, you know what, it's breathable. And then others say, it's not breathable. And others say, can we, can we not? So I said, forget about breathable, not breathable. There is an argument, okay? You agree. For one inch of paint, how much? For one inch of paint, I don't want to arrive on the day of judgment and suddenly find out, you know what? All your salahs were wrong. You say, oh no, man. I don't want to find out on the day of judgment that because of one inch of paint, when there were other alternatives such as henna or anything else that nobody argued with, because of one inch of paint, all my salah was not in order. And the opinion that stated that it was not valid was the correct opinion. And I find that out on the Day of Judgment. In Arabic language, it's called khurujan min al khilaf. To come out of the difference of opinion, do that which is safer. You're not going to die without putting a specific thing on your nails. You're not going to die without these things. I promise you. It's not going to kill you. People won't even notice. So what? We just wanted people to say, wow, looks nice. And your salah is gone. Everything's gone. Subhanallah. It looked nice, but it wasn't in pursuit of the pleasure of Allah. It was in pursuit of the comments of the people. That's what Instagram's all about. That's what Facebook's all about. That's what fingernail group book is all about. If, if there is a book called fingernail group book. I can't even say it. Because Facebook is supposed to be the face. I don't know. They show everything but the face. So my brothers and sisters, in reality, just be focused upon the pleasure of Allah. You'll enjoy the world. Dunya hasana, akhirati hasana. The last part of the dua is, waqina adhab nar Oh Allah, give us goodness in this world. Give us goodness in the hereafter. Save us from the punishment. Save us from the punishment of the fire. We all would like to be saved. My brothers and sisters, I hope that I've touched on uh, the pursuit of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why it is? And also a few examples of how to be able to achieve it, to be focused, inshallah, on that which is coming. It's definitely coming. There's no point in being frightened about death because it's definitely going to come and take every one of us. Rather prepare for it. We are concerned. We are worried to a certain extent because we have to. But we know definitely there is something far better awaiting us. And that is the pleasure of Allah. If Allah is pleased with you, you notice your dunya will be in order, your akhira will be in order, and everything else will be in order. I've spoken to you for 32 minutes and 25, 26, 28 seconds, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. It's just been an absolute honor and a pleasure. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.